So if we go way back to the beginning of this current move of God that began in the 1980s, before there were churches like Bethel even in existence, before Randy Clark was a name in the land, um, when Vineyard was itself kind of still fighting for viability and, and visibility, uh, before Toronto, before the Florida outpouring, before any of these moves of God, um, teaching about the kingdom of God tended to emphasize two aspects, the already and the not yet. And the already was that which is clearly seen and manifested, and the not yet is that which isn't yet seen and manifested, but which will come. And so we kind of wait for the not yet to become the already. And that's because when we study the teaching of Jesus, he talked about the inbreaking kingdom, and he talked about how the kingdom was at hand, but he also talked about when the kingdom would be fully consummated. So even in his teaching, there is this tension, and what it leads to is a two-age framework of already and not yet, and we live right there in the window, the time between the times. And if you, if you want to think about it this way, I've got to make sure I do my number line correctly. My upper elbow here would be the beginning of time, and as time marches on, eventually Jesus comes and breaks in, and then he ascends into heaven over here, and then time runs out, and then the kingdom's fully consummated. And what, we, what we're seeking to do effectively from a kingdom perspective is to narrow that window, to close it down like that. So in circles where that kind of theology is used, when people are healed, we tend to say, we're experiencing the already. And when they're not healed, we say, we're experiencing the not yet. And then what we tend to do is say, sorry, it sucks to be you, but there's nothing much we can do about that. And so we just leave it. And really all that is is a form of passivity, which is another word for unbelief. And so we don't want to be there. We want to move beyond that already not yet thing. And over time, we become soft in our approach to the supernatural side of kingdom demonstration. We may emphasize other valid expressions of the kingdom, for example, feeding, feeding the poor, things like that. Uh, but we forget the fundamentals of ministering as Jesus did, and we say that healing gone wrong is because of the not yet, and you'll just have to wait until heaven. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, all demons and every disease. So... There's a breakthrough there. Now, I, I want to pause here for just one sentence and say there are some other things that can also inhibit healing beyond demons. But right now, tonight, I'm focusing on that. So that's what I'm describing. But don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that all healing gone wrong is purely because of demons. We've got some other things that we've uncovered that can be causes of, of obstruction and you know, maybe over time, if I come back again, I'll do some more teaching on what some of those are. But tonight, we're talking about healing and deliverance, so that's where we are. Anyway, but what if some of those healings gone wrong aren't the result of the not yet? What if we've not addressed the root cause of the sickness, and what if healing is hindered because we've not addressed those demons that are present when they are present? And what if deliverance is needed much more often than we think? It's easy to overlook all of that because we become blinded by the very things that control our own culture in which we live. You get on a plane, you go to Taiwan, you might identify much more readily what's going on there. But because we're like pickles in brine, we tend not to see what's really happening in our own backyard. But often the most dramatic examples of kingdom inbreaking happen at that intersection of deliverance and healing. And so we have to employ deliverance to bring about the freedom that Jesus paid for with his own life. So what was done at the cross? Because that's the gateway to deliverance. And what was done at the cross is this, Colossians 2.15, God canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities. Rulers and authorities are two orders of demons in Paul's cosmology. And they occur that, those, that terminology occurs not only in Colossians, it occurs in Galatians and Ephesians. So he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. He humiliated them publicly, triumphing over them in him. So that's what happened at the cross. Jesus won. And if you will, this is the language of the arena. This is the language of gladiatorial combat. So it is to say that Jesus, and as his vanquished foe fell to the ground, he put his foot on his neck 
bloodied sword in hand and said, Christus Victor! That's a little more masculine, robust than gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And as he did, the emperor went, which would be the father, and so he turns his sword and went, and that ended that. You may not have thought, it that, thought about it that way, but that's the language Paul's using. I'm just illustrating it in a graphic way. Here's what else happened at the cross, Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, here are those words again, all rule and authority and power and dominion. Oh, even the next two levels up. Doesn't matter how big the demon, doesn't matter how wicked the demon, he is above it all and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. We're under the authority of Jesus. We are joined to him. He is the head of the body. And that means if you're in the body, no matter if you're a little pinky toe or an earlobe or an appendix or a nose hair or a hand or an eye or a knee, no matter what you think you may be in the body of Christ, all of it's underneath you because you're joined to him. That's what it's telling us. And the third part of it is that deliverance from evil spirits is guaranteed in the atonement, but it's not automatic. And a lot of people believe that as soon as you believe it's all done, you know, one and done kind of thing. But here's the reality. If you've ever been in a church, <laughs> you might know there's some demonized people around. How come they're not all free then? Hello? Not in New Jersey. In California, though, we do have this problem. New Jersey, you guys are more sanctified. <laughs> and the other, the other thing that is mixed up with that is if you study the history of the early church, which most people don't do, I know that, but you don't have to look hard to find the chronicles and annals of the first couple centuries of Christian life after the New Testament was written. I'm talking about the years roughly 90 to... I don't know, call it 300. During that period of time, it was common once people were converted, note that I said once they were converted, they would be taken through deliverance, including at the moment of baptism. And if everybody gets delivered the moment that they're born again, then why were these guys doing that? And they were a lot closer in culture and time and teaching to Jesus than we are. So maybe we've lost something that they had and it's time to recover it. So although deliverance is not automatic, it's guaranteed because deliverance is part of sanctification. And so deliverance is uh, part of the peak experience that brings sanctification to us. And it's maybe less exciting than the more commonplace practices of taking communion and going through baptism and going to Bible study and praying and meditating on the word and going to small group. All of these things will help you become more Christ-like also. But our, our Western model of of sanctification, according to all the theology books, if you read them, is something like this. You know, you, you get converted, and then you kind of chunk along, and you have your kind of ups and downs, but generally it's, it's up and to the, to the right, and it gets better over time, and then when you die, that's it. But I think the biblical model looks more like this. You get converted, then something happens. You get cleaned out, and then you go along, kind of consolidate your wins, and you get some more deliverance. And then you get some more and some more, and so you're already way up here before you go to glory. And that's much more biblical, and it's much more true to experience. And so we have to rethink what we're talking about. And as I said, deliverance is a peak experience. It's a moment where the power of God, the kingdom breaks in upon you, and those spirits are driven out, and now you experience freedom from, well, it might be mental illness, could be physical illness, but whatever it may be. By the way, just a, just a thought on that. I don't know why I feel led to say it right now, but many times people have organic problems, and by that I mean problems in their organs, liver, kidneys, etc., and oftentimes those problems have demonic pro uh, aspects to them. And I, I believe but can't absolutely prove it rigidly from Scripture. I, I could show you why I believe it, but I can't absolutely prove it. That this is why to the Jews in the Old Testament the eating of organ meat was forbidden. All organ meat was burned as part of the sacrifice to the Lord. And 
I've, I've just seen this over the years that many, many times when people have specifically organic conditions, lungs, brain, you know, any of that stuff, spleen, intestines, so on, much of the time the stuff that's going on there doesn't have a physical cause, it has a spiritual cause. Does that make sense? I just threw that in for fun. 